Welcome back as we continue our journey through the book Salvation is from the Jews with author Roy Showman. And Roy, when we left the last episode, you were discussing the uh, diabolical attacks on Christianity. Coming from the Third Reich. Coming from the Third Reich. And so why don't we pick that up there? And sure. Um, the, the, the thrust of my argument was that um, Nazism showed, especially in the last episode, we talked about how directly aimed against Christianity and the Christian church Nazism was. And in fact, that the hatred of the Jews and the attack on the Jews that flowed through Nazism was part and parcel of its hatred and attack on Christianity. Because after all, Christ was a Jew. And the Jews are the relatives of Christ by blood. And, you know, really vehement hatred of Christ is going to naturally express itself in both a hatred of the Christian faith and a hatred of the Jewish people. Uh, and this isn't only my interpretation, and let me maybe begin this show with a quote from uh, Cardinal Lustiger, who recently passed away, but he was the Cardinal Archbishop of Paris uh, for many years, and he was, in, he was also a Jewish convert or a fulfilled Jew, completed Jew. He had Jew. written a book on that, had he? He, he wrote a, a, a large, he wrote his memoirs, essentially. That's right, chosen by, choosing God, chosen by God, right. and he discusses that. But, so he, he makes the same point. Let me read from that book. Um, Hitler's anti-Semitism had its roots in the anti-Semitism of the Enlightenment and not in a Christian anti-Semitism. It was a refusal of the Jews' divine election a hate for their religious singularity. Um, the Jews, as figures of election, caused jealousy and catalyzed on themselves the Nazis' negation of man and God. So it was actually the Nazis' anti-Christianity that zeroed in on, like a laser beam on, on the Jewish people because of their divine election. Um, and um, that's a good way to kind of introduce the following theme. Um, as this will sound like a jump, but I'll justify why it isn't really as much of a jump as it sounds like. Um, if one thought of the Nazi hatred of the Jews and de desire to exterminate the Jewish race in purely kind of materialistic, racist, secular terms, then the uh, Arab world should have been right up there with the Jews as an inferior, dark-skinned, non-Aryan, non-blonde-haired, blue-eyed race. And they weren't? And not only were they not also an enemy of the Nazis, but they were, uh, in many ways, their best friends. And there was this tremendously deep and intimate collaboration between the Arab world and the Third Reich in both directions. In other words, both uh, the uh, Arab leaders loving and helping Hitler, and Hitler loving and helping the Arab leaders, which is in itself evidence, and I think we'll probably spend most of the show talking about that, that the impulse behind Nazi anti-Semitism wasn't a kind of materialistic racism at all, but it was a, basically a, a kind of a, a diabolical assault on God and his chosen people, as well as God and his church. Because when you stop to think about it, what, what characterizes the Arab world as well, to some extent, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush, is that um, uh, there also is an animosity, a hostility to the Jewish people, which I will talk about at some length. Mm -hmm. But there also is a non-embrace of Christianity and the embrace of a religion, Islam, which directly contradicts Christianity. Right. So um, it's logical. There's an old expression, my enemy's enemy is my friend. And to some extent, Christianity is the enemy both of the Third Reich and of the Islamic world. Interesting. So um, let me justify that, that um, somewhat counterintuitive statement that I um, made about this natural sympathy between the Arab world and um, uh, the Nazis of the Third Reich. Um, let me start by reading a quote of one of the founders of the Syrian Ba'ath Party. Uh, I don't know if that word Ba'ath or mm -hmm. Ba'athist resonates with you, but Saddam Hussein right. uh, recently um, toppled as the leader of Iraq. 
was um, very famous for being a Baathist, for being a leader of the Baath Party. And this is the very same party at its founding in the 1930s. And so here's one of the founders of the party in the 1930s. His direct quote, um, quote, we were racist, we admired the Nazis, we were immersed in reading Nazi literature and books. We were the first who thought of a translation of Mein Kampf. Anyone who lived in Damascus at that time was witness to the Arab inclination toward Nazism. Um, the, um, at the same time in the early 30s, the Young Egypt Party was founded in Egypt. Um, in fact, uh, the Young Egypt Party was the beginning of um, Gamal Nasser, who became the uh, leader of Egypt in, I think, in probably the 1960s, started with the Young Egypt Party. And the Young Egypt Party started out with a, uh, a really an adoption of Nazism. They, um, they adopted the stormtroopers. In other words, they had their own stormtroopers. They had the torch processions, like the Nazi torch processions. They adopted the Nazi slogan, one folk, one party, one leader. And they um, emulated the Nazis in their call for a total boycott of any, any uh, Jewish businesses and stores and so forth, and for physical attacks on Jews. And this is immediately. You're talking about the 1930s. That's this the is early 30s. And the um, poster boy for this collaboration, and I have a picture in the book which we might be able to get on the air of a, a personal, very intimate meeting between Hitler and this man, was he was the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. His name was Haj Amin al-Husseini. He, um, as the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Grand Mufti being the, the Muslim spiritual leader of Jerusalem, he declared, I declare a holy war, my Muslim brothers, murder the Jews, murder them all. He launched a number of pogroms against the Jews in the Holy Land, you know, to exterminate the Jewish population of a town. Um, he, um, he organized the Hebron Riot of uh, 1929, which decimated the Jewish population of Hebron, and the Jerusalem riots of 1929 and um, 1936 to 1939, you know, which were pogroms. They were right. violent attacks, um, you know, essentially slaughtering the Jews when they could. And he was an early, very early supporter of Adolf Hitler. In fact, um, Adolf, he Adolf Eichmann, Eichmann of the Eichmann trials, right, right. went to Palestine to meet with him in 1937, to meet with the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. And the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem tried to organize a pro-Arab coup, a pro-Nazi coup. In, um, and when that coup failed, he had to flee the Arab world, and he was received in Berlin as a personal guest of Hitler. Oh he was put up at um, a building which was called the Islamic Institute, which was actually a confiscated Jewish school. He was given a salary of, in those days, $20,000 a month, which was really a royal income in those <laughs> days. Um, he became a close friend of Eichmann. He toured Auschwitz with him. He, uh, when he did so, he encouraged the guards to greater diligence in exterminating the Jews. He um, established for Hitler an all-Muslim division of the SS called the Hanjar, um, which uh, made up of Bosnian Muslims. He went on um, Nazi uh, radio in Berlin, you know, with speeches exhorting the Muslims to, to slaughter the Jews. And the condition that he put on his cooperation with Hitler was permission from Hitler to exterminate every Jew in Palestine when the Third Reich took control of Palestine. And um, lest anyone think that this is a slander or a libel against him, he, um, he wrote this in his own memoirs. Let me read a passage from his own Please. memoirs. Our fundamental condition for cooperating with Germany was a free hand to eradicate every last Jew from Palestine and the Arab world. I asked Hitler for an explicit undertaking to allow us to solve the Jewish problem in a manner befitting our national and racial aspirations and according to the scientific methods innovated by Germany in its handling of the Jews. The answer I got was the Jews are yours. He drew up plans for um, you know, a concentration camp with gas chambers, and I believe it was Nablus. Um, he tried to get Germany to actually poison the wells in Palestine to, to send bombers and, and put poison in the uh, water supply, I should say, not the wells. And um, uh, after the war, 
Husseini was uh, sought for war crimes, but he fled to Egypt where he lived out his life as a hero of the Arab people. And not too many people today are familiar with the name Haj Amin al Husseini, mm -hmm. but they are probably familiar with his nephew. His nephew's given name it was Abd al Rahman, Abd al Bauf, Arafat al Qud al Husseini, <laughs> but he went by its shortened form, Yasser Arafat, oh, who was al Husseini's nephew and lived with him in Cairo after the war and in fact began as kind of a runner, a 16 year old, 17 year old, running messages for his uncle's organization. Um, and uh, in fact when Al Husseini died, um, uh, Yasser Arafat gave talks about what an honor it was to follow in his uncle's footsteps. And so um, this is, let me kind of get back on track on why this is interesting. First of all, it's just important for people to know right. that the Arab hatred of the Jews and desire to exterminate the Jews and desire to exterminate Israel is not based on the Palestinian problem and whether the Palestinians can return to their homes pre-1967 or pre-1948. We're talking about the 1920s, 1930s when you know there was no Palestinian problem, there, was no, there were no displaced people, the Jews who were living in Palestine were living in a non-Jewish country in houses and on land. They, you know, they bought retail you know, as real estate transactions. Mm -hmm. you know, there was no displacement of people. There was no you know, unfair manipulation or whatever. It was a, I will argue, actually a spiritual hatred, which is what it had in common with the hatred, the Nazi hatred of the Jews. Not even a racial hatred, but a spiritual hatred because the forces of the Antichrist, the forces opposed to Christianity and Christ, are always opposed to the church and opposed to the, essentially the, the blood relatives of Christ who are the Jews. Interesting. And, and that continues to this day. The, it did um, not die with Hitler. Um, it, is, it is true. Now we're going to get in a little bit of a delicate area. But we're going to have to talk about Islam and the religion of Islam because that's really what we're broaching. That's kind of the territory we're approaching. Um, because we really have to look at Islam because obviously Islam is what characterizes, it's the main spiritual force flowing through the Arab world and as well as much of the rest of the world now. <laughs> Maybe even high offices in the United States. Um, so where does Islam come from? What's the spiritual force behind Islam? I think most people know that Islam is based on the Quran, it's based on the revelations received by the Prophet, using the Islamic term, the Prophet Muhammad in the late 6th century. He lived late 6th century, early 7th century. In other words, around the year 600, plus or minus. Now, according to his account, he received uh, an extensive series of revelations in a cave from a spiritual being who he identified as the Angel Gabriel. And those spiritual revelations became written down in a form that's known as the Quran. Now, um, there are only really three possibilities, logically. Uh, either they weren't spiritual revelations at all, and he made up what became the Quran, or they are spiritual um, revelations from God, or they're spiritual revelations from a being who was pretending to be God or pretending to be the angel Gabriel with a message from God, but is really a fallen spiritual being, um, you know, counterfeiting himself as the angel Gabriel and counterfeiting the source of the Quran as God. Now, um, it is logically possible that the Quran, the, this revelation was of human origin, but if you look at the history of Muhammad, that uh, becomes difficult to understand or accept because uh, Muhammad was essentially illiterate. And the Quran is a very lofty, poetic Arabic that would seem to be beyond his, his human capabilities of generating. Um, it is impossible to see it as a revelation from God because it contradicts Christianity, contradicts other revelations that we know are true of God, including um, contradicting um, that Jesus died on the cross. It's, pro, you know, it's, it's sufficient to show that it wasn't, it wasn't God. 
but uh, contradicting Christianity in a number of places. Now, it is true that there are places in the Quran that speak positively, certainly of the Blessed Virgin Mary. There are places in the Quran that speak um, very negatively about Christians and Christianity, but there are also other places that speak positively about Christians and Christianity. And um, one has to be able to successfully explain that fact, but you can't explain that fact by simply saying the source of the revelation is God, because God would never say that Jesus never died on the cross, right. among other things. So logically, it really uh, seems to me the compelling alternative is, as we know, we know from Scripture, that not every angel that appears as an angel of light is genuinely an angel of light. And uh, the most probable explanation, I, I think, actually, to any Christian um, who actually looks into the Quran and looks into the revelations of Muhammad and also looks into the uh, personal uh, virtue formation of Muhammad is that the, the source was actually counterfeit and was the source that um, makes his living, so to speak, counterfeiting God and wants nothing other than to be mistaken for God. Well, and parts of the books that were... Um used by Muhammad or quoted from the New Testament were actually, I say New Testament, actually they were from the Apocrypha, the books that were uh, not included as part of the New Testament. And so I can't see that God would have contradicted his church, that he would have established a church, and they would have canonized a scripture, and then that would have been contradicted. And one of the stories I think of is, you know, in the Apocrypha where we're, Jesus made clay birds and threw them up in the air and they became real. This is one of the stories we see in the Koran. So we, we have... Um, yeah, and perhaps the most, the, the most blatant contradiction with Christianity is, um, well, I mean, it's rife with many contradictions with Christianity, but one is the Trinity. I mean, one is the, um, the nature of God himself in, in, in two ways, which are really the same way. Um, it is the nature of God either as a singular, solitary, and very solitary being, or as the Trinity, and the other is the nature of God as love. And both of those things, of course, they're two reflections of the same thing, right? Because the reason God is three persons is precisely because God is love, and love requires more than one person. Right. And both of those are anathema to Islam. And let me read a couple of quotes from the Koran. This is from uh, chapter 4, uh, verses uh, 48 to 51. Lo, um, God, Allah, Allah really is just the Arab word for God. So, you know, it doesn't, doesn't uh, etymologically mean anything but God, but I'll read it as it appears. Lo, Allah does not forgive that a partner should be ascribed to him. Whoever ascribes partners to Allah has indeed invented a tremendous sin. See how they invent lies about Allah. That in itself is a flagrant sin. Okay, it's a direct reference to Christianity and the sin of ascribing partners. Um, another quote, also from chapter four. This is verse uh, one seventy one. O oh, people of the scripture, do people of the scripture apply to Christians and Jews because they shared the the Old Testament? O oh, people of the scripture, do not exaggerate in your religion, nor utter anything about Allah except the truth. The Messiah, son of David, was only a messenger of Allah. So believe in Allah and his messengers, but do not say three. Cease, it would be better for you. Allah is only one Allah. Far removed is it from his transcendent majesty that he should have a son. Okay, so come on. The source of this revelation cannot be God or the angel Gabriel. So in some pagan religions where we saw they were truly worshiping God but did not know him fully, that's, that's not, clearly could not be the case here because of the contradictions. Well, actually... Um, let me point out a subtlety in what you said, which is when you are talking about uh, f uh, other religions, basically religions which are not entirely true, right. one has to distinguish uh, what comes down from above and what comes up from below. What, I can, what I'm happy flatly saying is the source of the revelation to Muhammad was not God, period. It was not one of the unfallen angels, period. Right. However, when a Muslim worships Allah, it is not clear who the recipient of that worship is. Because if his, if his heart is right, this is true of pagans also. Right. We saw yes. this in the three kings who came to worship... Thank you for worship, the because this is important. The, ...who came to worship the infant Jesus. Um, Non-Christians, if their heart is in the right place, when they're worshiping through a false religion, might actually be worshiping the true God, even though that is not the desire of the source of the revelation of that religion.
Okay, so going up from the bottom, I'm not prepared to say that any given Muslim is not worshiping God, but I am prepared to say, coming down from the top, that the source of the revelation was not God. Um, but so, um, the, um, I, 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 I better kind of get back on track and wrap up. But th this to me shows where that natural sympathy between the Arab world and Nazism came, which was that, that the, the source of the inspiration behind both was exactly that spiritual force whose point in life is to uh, essentially attack Christ, attack Christianity, and uh, finally, if possible, block the second coming. And so I will uh, probably spend the last minute or two talking about that, but I think it's worthwhile to go back to what we talked about a little bit earlier, which was um, if one sees, if one sees the, um, the attempt to exterminate the Jews in the Holocaust as coming from Satan, one can ask, why should Satan be so concerned about destroying the Jewish people if they no longer play a role in salvation history. We know that there have to be Jewish people around at the time of the second coming. We know that the Jewish people played a huge role in the first coming. We have hints that the Jewish people will at least indirectly play some role in the second coming. And perhaps I'll have time to read some quotes from the current Holy Father that suggest the same thing. And so one can see the attack on the Jews throughout history, and especially in our current period of history, as being an attack on perhaps the imminence of the second coming, an attempt to abort the second coming. And we can see the Nazi attempt to exterminate the Jews in that light, and maybe we can even see the virulent, murderous hatred of the Jewish people across the world coming from um, the Arab world and to some extent coming from Islam in that light. You build a compelling as you go through a lot of other examples in this chapter, that this was not just a, a single incident of uh, Al Husseini, but or his nephew, but it, it went into. Um, you mentioned uh, Saddam Hussein, and you mentioned some of the other uh, current leaders that, um, and you give several examples as well on um, quotes from the Arab world that uh, Hitler was was their hero. Was their hero. And, and his was, only fault was he did not succeed in exterminating all of the Jews. Right. And those are, those are quotes And was of misrepresented leaders. to get him out of office. And I was fascinated when I read this because this, this went on, I think your quotes stopped uh, right when you published the book. So this went on right to current day. Uh, was not something that ended in the 40s um, with Hitler. Um, so it, it, it was very sobering. Uh, and I appreciate you... Um, addressing this. Again, we get into a, another little delicate topic it's, it's, here. It's really spiritual because um, it's like uh, the, the, the underlying social theology in the Arab world is that the Jews are the source of all of the corruption in the world, of all of the evil in the world. That's spiritual. That's not, right. and they're not that powerful. They're, they're one half of one percent of the world population. Even if they wanted to, they couldn't be the source of all of the corruption and evil in the world. It is, it is a genuine spiritual anti-Semitism. Well, thank you again. I um, continue to enjoy the book and enjoy the, the, the conversation that we're able to have here. We'll um, close now in thanking you for joining us, and we hope you'll join us again next week. Uh, continue to read the book, Salvation is from the Jews, and we'll continue to try to unpack it and go deeper with the author, Roy Shulman, as we continue with this series. Thank you. God bless.